But back to Gilgamesh. What happened to these tablets, the tablets that George Smith had identified as Gilgamesh, is that a young German in his 30s came to the British Museum and copied them, made line drawings of the cuneiform. All of them. What he didn't do is translate them. So that wasn't much good, except if you could read cuneiform. And as I've said, only two people could. But slowly, scholars worked through this material and made it more available. And more stuff kept turning up. So in, the, in 1930, Campbell Thompson, an Oxford Assyriologist, published an edition of the Epic of Gilgamesh that included 112 tablets and fragments, mainly from Nineveh, from Laird's original find, a few late Babylonian tablets from Rassam's acquisitions that had been <coughs> processed and recognized, only a few. We're talking two or three, and, and that's 70,000 tablets. Some old Babylonian tablets, which were much, much, a thousand years older than the Kyunjik stuff, than the Assyrian tablets, they had begun to emerge on the market as the people began to dig through the mounds. They got stuff not only from uh, the first millennium BC, but also tablets from much older time. And elsewhere, not only in Mesopotamia, but also in Turkey, tablets were turning up, so Campbell Thompson was able to make use of one Gilgamesh tablet from Anatolia. But the story is a process of accru accrual, of, of, of aggregation. There's much more. So when I came to repeat the work of uh, Campbell Thompson uh, in 2003, there were 217 sources extant, uh, 184 from the first millennium, the Neo-Assyrian manuscripts from Kyunjik and the late Babylonian manuscripts from the south of the place, uh, or, or south of the country but also 33 much older tablets uh, between four and 3,000 years old. And my part in this has been one of uh, a succession of Assyriologists who are pioneers in deciphering uh, <laughs> tablets, of reconstructing uh, the literature of ancient Mesopotamia. We stand on each other's shoulders I am only the most recent person to do Gilgamesh. There will be someone coming later who will continue the work and uh, do more of it, find more of it, decipher more of it, and present a better edition. So, as I say, pioneering work, but uh, a constant aggregation of new manuscripts and new knowledge means that we get more and more of this 4,000-year-old epic poem. And just to illustrate the fact that new material keeps turning up and fills the gaps, here's a, a news article from the uh, London Times from 2015. Uh, we've got 226 sources now, still rising. Uh, last one discovered only last year. Uh, here's a, a tablet that was found in Suleimania Museum. A lot of the work of, of identifying tablets occurs not in archaeology but in museums where it still have vast quantities of uncatalogued collections of clay tablets to sift through. And this piece was identified in Suleimania Museum in the Kurdish regional government controlled part of Iraq in 2012. And uh, a colleague and I published it in sh shortly afterwards. And then it hit the media in 2015, where you can see this piece here, uh, even got coverage in a, a daily newspaper. Um, and then got commented on by bloggers. And here's Here's a wonderful blog from the history blog. Uh, a gentleman called Bort. Bort says he discovered there were new passages of Gilgamesh, and he's a bit worried about that. So he tells everyone, for the love of all that's good in the world, don't read the new passages out loud. That's how the old ones are summoned. <laughs> or so I've heard. Well, at least don't try to read them in the native tongue, okay? I don't know if that which shan't be named understands English, <laughs> but that which shan't be named certainly understands Babylonian, <laughs> in his mind. Well, I hope Bort's not here because we're gonna read some later in the original <laughs> Babylonian. So there's all these bits I've explained that have been dis discovered in archeological excavation and in museums. What do we do with them as a seriologist in order to reconstruct the poem. Well, I'll just give you an idea of what happens. Tablets come out in small pieces. Here's a, a bunch of tablets, uh, not, not Gilgamesh tablets, but never mind. You can see the extent of the problem. They're made of 
baked, of, of, of sun-dried clay, not baked usually, but sun-dried, so they are very fragmentary, particularly once you expose them and get them out of the matrix of earth in which they rest. They very, very rapidly deteriorate unless they're conserved. And here's a, a workman at Nipper in the 1950s painstakingly getting out a tablet from the bulk here with a paintbrush and a little knife to free it with. So it's difficult work and very fragile work getting these things out of the ground archaeologically. And then there are the problems of conservation. But here is a very famous Gilgamesh tablet, the flood tablet, one of the ones that, that George Smith identified in the 1870s. What we do with them is we make line drawings of what are essentially three-dimensional objects. And here is my line drawing of, of this column of that tablet there. And then we find that because the literature of ancient Mesopotamia was essentially canonical, uh, as, belonged to a stream of tradition in which people kept on writing out the same stuff, you get multiple witnesses to the same text. And Gilgamesh is no exception. We get passages where there are four or five different sources for a set of lines. Some passages we don't have any sources for, but that's the other side of the coin. And these sources are fragmentary, but what we can do is use the different surviving bits to put together the text that they both hold on them. So it's a kind of jigsaw puzzle, but using fragments of different jigsaws. But since that's the same picture, you eventually get, achieve, uh, a reconstructed text. Now, if you take a look here, this is the bottom uh, of the column of the flood tablet down here, there. And this is another manuscript of the same flood tablet. And if you look very carefully, you can see that the signs here are replicated here. There's ut, and there's ut, and there's iba, and there's ba, and there's uhammatu, and there's the end of uhammatu there, and there's dipa. And there's Deepa there. You can see that it's the same sign. So we, we've got two different witnesses to the same part of the text. And what we do with them, having drawn them, is we can transliterate them into Roman script because the script is nicely deciphered. And there you can see the Ut, Ut. And here's the Iba bit. And there's the Khamatu bit. And there's the Deepa bit. Uh, singly by manuscript. And we can put those together so that we get a combined manuscript. And it's beginning to look like text that you can use, and indeed, then we can turn it into language, because the great thing about this script is it has vowels as well as consonants. And here we get something that we can read out, if Bort will allow us, and if he's here, please, he could leave. Tarkulli erakali nassach illak ninurta michri ushardi, annunnaki ishu di parati ina namririshanu hammatumatu sha'adad shuharassu Ibau shame, mima namru anada ummati utteru. And that's the Babylonian. I don't know whether a Babylonian would understand that, but when a Syriologist talk to each other, they can understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can translate, and we get this translation here. It's the point in the story where Utanapishti is telling Gilgamesh about the flood that he experienced so long ago, a first person account of the flood, and he tells this. Uh, he, he, he paints this lovely picture of the onset of the storm that caused the flood. The god Erakal was uprooting the mooring poles. Ninurta passing by made the weirs overflow. The Anunnaki gods carried torches of fire, lightning, scorching the country with brilliant flashes. The stillness of the storm god passed over the sky, and all that was bright then turned into darkness. So this process of deciphering fragments, of identifying the text on them, of putting text together from different fragments and finally getting lines that can be translated, goes on and on for every part of Gilgamesh and indeed for every Babylonian narrative poem and all other uh, literary compositions that are part of the stream of tradition that the Babylonians <coughs> passed down and the Assyrians passed down. And gradually through this process, being conducted by a very few people around the world, we are recovering the oldest literatures in human history, the Babylonian literature, the Sumerian literature before it. 
but it's painstaking work. It's very rewarding work. And we begin because we can understand this poetry, not only to hear it aesthetically, but we begin also to analyze it and see how it's structured. And Babylonian poetry is rather carefully structured. Each line is usually a statement or two statements. We haven't got long sentences that go on forever. I was reading Charlotte Bronte's Villette the other day, and there's a sentence in there which goes on for a page and a half. <laughs> but you can't do that in Babylonian poetry. A sentence will normally stop at the end of the line, or at the most go on to two lines, but very often a line is two statements. But the first and the second statements kind of support each other. So we see here, this is about what happens when the storm hits the rivers. It uproots the mooring poles and the weirs overflow. And then we get the lightning gods coming, carrying lightning and scorching the country. And then we get the storm god, the calm before the storm, the stillness passed over the sky and it all goes very dark. So the ideas are carefully separated in the poetry and we get, move through it through a process of short statements which are often are bound together in pairs. And I want now to go on to have a look at the poet's art just with a couple more examples. Uh, this one is the seduction of Enkidu. And if you remember the way that Enkidu was got from the wild into Uruk to become the chum, the, the, the friend of Gilgamesh, was he was seduced by a prostitute. And this is Akkadian. I won't read it, but you can see that I've made bold some nouns in it which are important in the way that the poetry is constructed. And if we look at the translation, the same nouns are here, also uh, separated from the main text, but by colors. And this, again, is poetry which is carefully constructed so that the first two couplets are the coming together of these two people, Shemchet, Shemchet the prostitute and Enkidu, it to have sex together. The second set of two couplets, four-line passage, is actually the sexual intercourse. And then the third one, again, two couplets, has something else happening. So, in fact, we're seeing kind of verses. The interesting thing is that here, Shamchat unfastened the cloth of her loins, she bared her sex and he took in her charms, so she takes her clothes off. She did not recoil, she took in his scent, she spread her clothing and he lay upon her. So they now come together on the ground, on her clothing. And then she did for the man the work of the woman, his passion caressed and embraced her, that's say, the intercourse starts, and then it lasts for six days and seven nights. Enkidu was erect as he coupled with Shamchat. The way that the poet has organized the text is that Shamchat occurs there and there, and Enkidu is sandwiched between, because his entire concentration, his, his, his mind, his senses, are all, at that point, concentrated upon the prostitute. So here he is, sandwiched between Shamchat. And he hasn't a thought for anything else, a glance for anything else. He's absorbed entirely with the prostitute. But after the intercourse has stopped, when with her delights he was fully sated, he turned his gaze to his herd. These are the animals he grew up with in the wild. The gazelles saw Enkidu and started to run. The beasts of the field shied away from his presence. And if you look here again, Enkidu is sandwiched this time, not by the prostitute, whom he's had enough of, but by the animals with whom he grew up. His herd called here the beasts of the field as well. So it's a mark of a very careful poetic organization. And uh, Babylonian poetry is like this. It's very formal. It has a particular way of, of, of telling narrative in short statements. But also more complex things happen. So that here we can see that the poet has thought very carefully about where to put the name of Enkidu. Not here, but here. An old Babylonian example is, is this, this uh, tablet from the 18th century BC, joined from uh, a piece in the Berlin and a piece in, in the British Museum. They were put together in 1994 when they were allowed to kiss, just briefly, 
at a conference in Berlin, but then this piece went back into the pocket of the curator from London and was taken home again, and they are now divorced. But this is a passage in which Gilgamesh reaches the end of the world, and he meets an alewife who asks what he's doing, and he says, explains, I, I've got to go and see Utanapishti because I want to become immortal. Where is he? Can you help me get there? And she says, don't be silly. No one's ever done that. In any case, there are better things to do with your life than go on a mad quest for immortality. Why don't you make merry each day, dance and play day and night? Let your clothes be clean. Let your head be washed. May you bathe in water. Gaze on the little one who holds your hand. Let a woman enjoy your repeated embrace. For such is the destiny, the text now runs out, but it must be of mortal men. And the fourth line of this verse, the second line of this couplet, is lost. But again, we can see in play, the ideas come in two-line couplets here. Make merry, dance and play. Keep nice and clean. Enjoy the company of your family, for that's what you've got to do. Good advice. And this is actually one of the most famous bits, I think, of, of, of Gilgamesh, not only because it, it, it's such a beautiful little picture of, of domestic harmony and s simple living wherein lie human happiness, but also because it's so like a passage in Ecclesiastes. Now, another thing I like about this is when it says, gaze on the little one who, hand gaze on the little one who holds your hand, the Akkadian is subi sechram sabitu kartika. And I don't know whether I'm the only person in the world who thinks that in the sound subi and sabitu, subi and sabitu, there's little kissing noises because you kiss your babies when you bounce them on your knee. So that we can, because we have the vowels and we have the words, we can understand and appreciate aesthetically the Gilgamesh epic. It's more than just a story. We can appreciate it as well, not just for what it tells us in terms of a narrative, but also in terms of the way it's structured and the sound of it, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do after 3,000 years. Now, the last avenue of approach to the Epic of Gilgamesh is to ask the question, does this old poem mean anything to a modern readership, a modern audience, 4,000, 3,000 years later? Good question, though. Well, this passage, which we've just seen, ends with this statement, such is the destiny of mortal men. So you understand here, already in the old Babylonian poem, and I haven't, yet I haven't really properly explained that because of the nature of our discoveries of clay tablets, we have versions of the text from the old Babylonian period at the 4,000 years ago, as well as for much later from the Nineveh, which is three, uh, two and a half thousand years ago. So we've got uh, a history of the text as well as uh, uh, the, the extent of the poem to be considered. But in this old Babylonian episode, uh, already the poet is saying, this is human destiny. There's a message going out here to the readership or the audience. This poet is telling you something about the human condition, that it's the duty of humans to make merry, to be clean, and to enjoy family life. That's what we're for. Well, this idea that the, of a poet who wants to tell us about the human condition is very much more clear from the first millennium version of the poem, of which we've got much more. And it begins like this. We already <laughs> begin to see the nature of the interest of this poet from the very beginning of the poem. And it starts like this. Shanakpa i muruishtimati, alkakati du kalama hassu. He who saw the deep, the country's foundation, who knew the proper ways, was wise in all matters. Gilgamesh, who saw the deep, the country's foundation, who knew the proper ways, was wise in all matters. Immediately you're familiar, this is Babylonian poetry, we're doing things two lines at a time, and here the second couplet is the same as the first, but with the name Gilgamesh chucked in. He explored everywhere the seats of power and learnt of everything the sum of wisdom. He saw what was secret, discovered what was hidden. He brought back a tale of before the deluge. So he went everywhere, learnt everything, 
including secret stuff from the most ancient period. Uh, that's the burden of the two couplets there. He came a far road. He went a long way. He went all over the world. Was weary, found peace. All his labours were set on a tablet of stone. And there's a change here from a very active hero, going everywhere, finding out stuff, going a long way, coming back, and suddenly everything goes non-active. He was weary. He found peace. And he didn't even himself write his labours on a tablet of stone. They were passively set there. It's as if he went on this long journey, and then, having come home, he couldn't do anything more. He was exhausted. He'd just stopped. Which is interesting. It tells us a little bit about what we might expect in the poem. A story about a man who went on a long journey, did everything, found out everything, but then stopped. The end of this prologue has an address to the reader or the audience, but in the, in the singular. So it, the poet is talking to each and every one of us individually. It says, climb Uruk's wall and walk back and forth, survey its foundations, examine the brickwork. Were its bricks not fired in an oven? Did the seven sages not lay its foundations? Typical Babylonian poetry again, two little couplets there. Telling you what to do, you've got to climb up and have a look around this great city wall that Gilgamesh built. And it asks you these questions. It's old, isn't it? Very old, made of this expensive material, baked brick. And then you get this very strange statement, which is in prose. Now, Babylonian poets didn't put prose in their poetry, but this one did. And if he did, he did it for a very good reason. So this is not some kind of footnote. This is really very important, and we'll find out why in a moment. We go back to poetry. While walking around on this wall, you've got to find a tablet box of cedar and release its clasps of bronze. Lift the lid of its secret, pick up the tablet of lapis lazuli, and read out. That's the end of the sequence of four lines arranged in the two line couplets. Find this thing, open up the lid, lift out the tablet, and read. And then there's a fifth line, which doesn't belong in the, in the structure of the poem. It's, it's extraneous. It's just as odd, this fifth line, as this bit of prose is here. And so I say this is important also, extra important, because it's disjunctive. It's, it's breaking up the poem, and it's doing that because the poet wants you to pay special attention now. And the special attention to which you've got to pay, which you've got to pay, is to this line, read out the travails of Gilgamesh, all that he went through. So now we see this is not a poem anymore about a hero who is glorious, a great king who undertakes heroic deeds. This is a poem about a person who went through hardship. The travails of Gilgamesh, all that he went through. And that is the end of the prologue. So everything that follows the story of Gilgamesh in this first millennium version of the poem the standard Babylonian Gilgamesh, is expressed as the travails of Gilgamesh, as hardship. It was an epic career of pain. And when he gets there to the flood hero's island at beyond the waters of death at the edge of the earth, Utanapishti, the flood hero, has things to say to him which might be said to all of us. There's a kind of sermon or homily he says to Gilgamesh, what are you doing going on this mad quest? You look a mess. All your clothing's worn out. And you've abandoned your city and come out here. And you're a king. You're not supposed to be doing this stuff. And he tells him some home truths. Man is snapped off like a reed in a cane break, he says. The comely young man, the pretty young woman, all too soon in their prime, death abducts them. And then there's an empty line. It's a kind of shocking void. That's, you're supposed to sit up now. You sit up, my God, yes. We're thinking about death now. Well, Gilgamesh has been fleeing death. He doesn't want to think about death. He wants to avoid death. Death horrifies him. And so there's an empty space while it all sinks in. 
And Uttanapishti goes on, he says, no one at all sees death, no one at all sees the face of death, no one at all hears the voice of death, death so savage who hacks men down. Yes, death is there, he tells Gilgamesh. And you won't see him, you won't hear him, but there he is. He is a fact of human existence. And Gilgamesh doesn't want to hear this. But Uttanapishti continues. And he talks about human life in general. In terms of human families, the smallest human unit of human society, ever, he says, do we build our households, ever do we make our nests, ever do brothers divide their inheritance, ever do feuds arise in the land. You know, so life goes on, we start families, we have children, then the brothers fall out over the inheritance and they are cross with each other and they don't talk. But the whole thing goes on again. It's ever, 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 ever. It all happens over and over again. But also what happens over and again is this stanza here. Ever the river has risen and brought us the flood, the mayfly floating on the water. There's a mayfly there. On the face of the sun its countenance gazes, then all of a sudden nothing is there. So there's a contrast here between the communal life of human beings, creating their families in a kind of cycle that goes on and on and on, and the individual mayfly that lasts but a moment before it disappears without trace. It sees the sun for a moment and it's gone. The mayfly, every, mayfly everywhere is a symbol of the brevity of human life. But first of all, in Gilgamesh. And then finally, Uttamanapishti talks about human destiny. He says, the abducted and the dead, how alike is their lot, but never was drawn the likeness of death. Earlier he talked about death abducting human beings, but there's a difference between people who are kidnapped by the enemy and people who are dead, because you're never going to see the dead again. Never in the land did the dead greet a man. And there's another empty line there, another shocking void, as it sinks in to Gilgamesh. The death is actually final. It's, there's no coming back. And Uttanapishti explains, the Anunnaki, the great gods, held an assembly, and Mamitum, the mother goddess, maker of destiny, fixed fates with them. Both death and life they have established. But the day of death they do not disclose. And elsewhere we find that life is what the gods kept for themselves. Death is what they gave to mankind. So you're going to die, says Uttanapishti, and you don't know when. And it's final. It's final. And then we come to the end of the poem. A meditation on death, this poem turns out to be then. But it's not all gloom. At the end of the poem, Gilgamesh, having returned from Uttanapishti's island across the waters of death with his friend the ferryman, and having lost on the way the plant of rejuvenation, which was his last compensation, comes back to Uruk, his hometown, and he addresses his companion with these words. He says, O Urshanabi, climb Uruk's wall and walk back and forth. And we immediately find we're in a stanza we had before, right at the beginning, when the poet was asking each individual in his audience to climb Uruk's wall and walk back and forth, survey its foundations, examine the brickwork. Were its bricks not fired in an oven? Did the seven sages not lay its foundations? A square mile is city. A square mile date grove. A square mile is clay pit. Half a square mile, the temple of Ishtar. Three square miles and a half is Uruk's expanse. And that's that passage of prose again from the introductory prologue, coming up again at the end. And not just anywhere at the end, but at the very, very end. This is the end of the poem. It stops at that point with this passage of prose, which looks as if it's a footnote out of Baedeker or something like that. But again, I would say it's prose, and it's at the end, and the poet put it there deliberately. What on earth does he mean? There must be some message here for us. 
For a long time, Assyriologists thought the whole business was about the wall, that this was Gilgamesh's monument. And so it is. He built the wall, and you can still see it. Around Uruk, the site in southern Iraq, where Gilgamesh once lived. But the point at the bottom is neglected. It's a city, and it's made up of different things. City, date grove, clay pit, temple. What do these mean? Here they are. Uruk's expense, city, date grove, clay pit, and temple. All taken from Babylon, but nevertheless. They symbolize something, I think. They symbolize the sum of human life. City is the dwelling houses where families procreate, live, continue over and over again this cycle of human fam uh, family building that Utanapishti talked about. Date Grove is food production. The clay pits represent manufacturing industry. And the temple, spiritual and intellectual life. And it's very interesting that it's only half as big as the other portions of the city. There's a quote from Tolstoy there, but uh, I won't go into that, I don't think. We don't need Tolstoy at this time of the evening, do we? Perhaps, perhaps we do, I don't know. But uh, I left the slide out that that, uh, that refers to. So Uruk's expense is the sum of human life. And what Gilgamesh is telling Urshanabi, he's come home. He's done his bit. He's exhausted. He's stopped. Anich Urshubshuk. Tired, but at peace. Nothing more in his life is going to happen. He tells his companion, go up onto the wall of Uruk and observe there the city. And what do you see? You see human life. And the curtain comes down. And that's it. The poet is saying, yes, individuals go on their great quests. Sometimes they get what they want. More often, they don't get what they want. And all of them have to come to terms with the great fact of human life, which is human death. All of us. But there is another life of humans that is not individual. The life of humans that is communal. And we must remember that Babylonia is not a modern Western country, instilled with the notions of the freedom of the individual that so inculcate our culture. It, our culture is about the individual, the rights of the individual, the place of the individual. I think Babylonia was a more Asian place. It was more, the idea was, we're a community. We belong as part of that community. We have to act within that community. And what this poet is saying is, the individual is a mayfly who dies without trace. But human life, as represented by the city, where you can see all human life, goes on forever. <laughs>